inviting him as an author presentation. You know, I just assumed he was a local historian that had written a book, but I am so obsessed with, he, John <laughs> is just a renaissance man. He's doing everything. It's not just history. That's just a small part. I've just got this intro I, I need to read from his website. He's got a great website and a TikTok channel for all you TikTokers out there. So Seattle's John Goodfellow is a shepherd, but not in the traditional <laughs> sense. He doesn't meander through pastoral hills guiding animals to graze green grass. Rather, Goodfellow <laughs> is a shepherd of cosmopolitan cities. The multi-interested, multi-faceted philosopher, author, and musician aims to guide and focus the burgeoning cultures within a given bubbling metropolis, all for the sake of fostering deep listening, diverse interactions, and real conversations between people. To understand his buoying efforts, all you need to do is examine how Goodfellow spends his time and energies. Look first to Banya 5, the Russian-style bathhouses he founded in the Emerald City, where community, read not illicit behavior, is centralized in mm -hmm. these locations. People can visit for more than a sense of afternoon repose. At Banya 5, patrons leave feeling re reinvigorated and re-energized by the waters, massage, and healthy <coughs> temperature extremes. I'm definitely going to check this place out. <laughs> or look to Goodfellow's musical project, Go El Grande Go, the moniker for which El Grande he affectionately earned by living in the Lower East Side in New York City during the 80s as an inspiring artist and inventor. With Go El Grande Go, Goodfellow writes songs about the human condition, about what it means, and what it takes to live honestly. Goodfellow, who was born and raised in Seattle proper, has spent a great time, a great time of traveling the world from Utah to Vietnam, and it's the ties that connect people and how individuals live day to day that inspire him. Uh, as Goodfellow says, thinking is important in my world, so he never stops doing it. If he's not working on a song or taking a steam or a schwitz, uh, the Seattle Renaissance man, yes, Renaissance man, are you, may are you? be composing or editing a new <clears throat> book. He's written a book about <clears throat> Seattle's coal industry and the ever-changing relationship between people and modern technology, both rudimentary and electric. For as much as he tries to connect large groups of diverse people, Goodfellow also works to find how deep their cultural roots went. And then one last project that I have to tell you about that his colleague Derek and good friend Derek to support him tonight um, is working on. Uh, Goodfellow has co-founded Sama, Seattle Sacred Music and Art with DJ producer Derek Mazzoni. Um, which aims to bring musicians to the Emerald City from all over the world, including areas like the Middle East, Africa, Eastern Europe. And while these efforts have uh, been affected recently by the COVID-19, it does not mean Goodfellow has halted his energies. Indeed, Goodfellow has a uh, need to work, has a need to work, be curious, learn, provoke, and listen. These impulses are the fundamental pillars that help a city anywhere on our planet coalesce and flourish and they're what Goodfellow loves most. <laughs> so we're so grateful that you used some of your Renaissance <laughs> Wow, I'll just let you know I did not write that. <laughs> That's uh, pretty amazing. Well, when I look at this, the first thing I think about 2019, like COVID and <clears throat> everything was shut down and there were all these crows in the parking lot and it was a very spooky time. <clears throat> so I'm really glad to see you all. And Newcastle Historical Society, Black Diamond Historical Society, Mo, I mean, the information that I'm presenting tonight, it's all out there. It's just a matter of putting it together. I mean, we forgot our coal history. I think myself, it's because of the World's Fair in 62. We were all going to become electronic and it was all going to, we're all going to go into the future and leave that old coal behind. But the truth is that coal gave us an industrial base that we're going to talk about tonight um, and really made this area what it is. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> So just to review for a quick second, um, 
We almost probably know this already, but coal is made by crushing uh, plants and also animals uh, over millions of years and with heat and pressure. And that makes coal. Peat, which is used in Ireland, is actually coal before it's become hard and is coal. Um, <clears throat> in this area, there uh, was the first mines were actually in Renton, uh, where we are, we are Renton. Um, and they were going to see a slide coming up about that and it was going down the Black River which existed then before the lake was fallen and went into Puget Sound like in 1850. I mean this is before the Seattle, the battle for Seattle, the Indian Wars that were going on there. Uh, <clears throat> the next mine of all places was Issaquah um, and you can see this right here is subbitumous. All this striped stuff is subbitumous coal. Um, so Issaquah, which um, we'll get to in a second, but it, it just turned out to be too far to come to Seattle. So it, it kind of went into ambience until there was a railroad there, which became the Burke Gilman Trail. Um, <clears throat> and then Newcastle was one. It was the first one to be commercially successful um, when it got a contract with the Central Pacific going from San Francisco across the country. Um, and then after Newcastle came a black diamond here and you can see this area here is all that's bitumous coal um, and Ravensdale and Bain and Cumberland and all these places opened after the railroad uh, came through but while Newcastle, Issaquah, Renton were around there was no trains coming here this was all taken to Seattle and taken by maritime down mostly to San Francisco okay next slide so, I mean, this is what Seattle looked like when there was coal coming down from Renton to uh, Seattle. It was, this is the battle plan of the Battle of Seattle. Um, you know, you can see there's one, two, three, there's not very much here. But there is Yesler Way, and there is Yesler's Dock, and there's Yesler's Sawmill. And Yesler's Dock continued to serve as a place for coal that came from say Newcastle over the trail that went to Lake Washington um, would be stored out here on the end of Yesler's mill. It was also the first place where coal was used from Newcastle and from Issaquah to do in the forgery and to make uh, for shaping iron bits for the sawmill. So it really is the beginning of the industrial revolution in the Northwest is to have have this coal machinery, you know, boilers, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But it was there from the very beginning. It was there from a very, very early time. Okay, next slide. This picture of the Issaquah coal mine, this is in the 1880s, so, you know, a lot later than the 1850s, but this technology is, you know, classic uh, mule technology. Uh, like I told you, the Issaquah mine eventually got connected to the uh, um, Seattle Lakeshore and Eastern Railway or Railroad, which is, became the Burke Gilman Trail. That trail was originally a, a coal road to get the coal from Issaquah. Next slide. So here are two of my particular technological heroes. Um, over here is James Coleman. Uh, we'll actually start with Yesler. So he was a millwright uh, out of Ohio, and he came to Seattle and put up the first steam engine um, lumber mill. It's only like 12 horsepower, uh, but it's pretty effective. And for the first time, Seattle started getting, instead of having like log houses, you could have plank houses, have modern houses. Um, James Coleman on the left, he was an engineer, Scottish engineer. Uh, I think we've all heard of the Seattle Walla Walla, the, the train that was supposed to go from Seattle all the way to Walla Walla. Well, it didn't make it to Walla Walla, but it did make it to Renton. And he was the one who did it and made it happen. And the reason it went to Renton was because that's where the coal mines were. There was uh, the Talbot coal mine, um, and there was another one uh, as well. But, you know, it, he did it. He, he did, that, that works, go get coal from there and then bring it back to Seattle. Okay, next one. This is the picture of Seattle in 1878. 
Uh, there's a coal, this right here is the coal wharf that goes over to Lake Union. And then from Lake Union, it went over where 520 passes to Lake Washington, then from Lake Washington up to Newcastle. So this is a very involved, expensive way to haul coal, but they did it. They, and they would haul it down here. And there's a little train right there. Um, and I, this is, I was doing a project in Lake Union on kind of the vessels that had been sunk there. And that's when I realized that this was a, there was a coal dock here and that they were unloading coal from Newcastle and started me on this adventure of wanting to know, know more about the coal in this area. There's also, here's a, this little barn right here. That's Yesler's dock right there. And that barn right there is his little coal shed. I did a lot of uh, bag trade, uh, bags of coal. I don't know how, does anyone know how heavy these bags were? Well, I mean, they, were, they look, if you see them in pictures, they're like this big by this, they're pretty heavy. Um, but they did a lot of that trade that way. And then this here is King Street, uh, which is the coal wharf as well. And you can see there's a sailing ship there. This coal was going mostly to San Francisco. It was used locally for some things. We'll see some domestic uses of it, but really it was going to San Francisco. San Francisco did not have um, coal. They had, they had some coal resources, but very, very minor coal resources. Um, hence, they got most of their coal by maritime. This is, again, before Seattle is connected by trains, when everything is being done with sailing ships, with tugboats pulling sailing ships up to the Straits of Juan de Fuca so they can go down to San Francisco. Um, it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a different time. Okay, next. This is a picture of San Francisco during the same time. You know, A, you can see how many ships there are. San Francisco was a pretty major metropolis when Seattle was not. Um, there's you know, gas works over here. You see this little smudge cloud? It looks like that's like a probably coal. You could, these are all one, two, three, four. You probably can't see that very well from where you're sitting, but there's lots of coal stacks here south of Market. This is Market going up and down. That was really the industrial area. And you know, ships were going to China. They were going to uh, around the cave. I mean, they, this San Francisco needed a lot of coal and they got it from Seattle. In fact, the Mount Diablo, which is outside of about 30 miles outside of San Francisco, had a coal mine. Um, but the, at some point they did, gave up the ghost when Seattle got the railroad uh, connecting across the continent and they moved the entire the, the all the people, uh, machinery and everything to Black Diamond. And then that became Black Diamond, the Norton uh, Black Diamond Coal Company from Norton. Okay, next. Uh, we were talking about Renton and how important Renton was at the beginning. I mean, it continued to uh, produce coal up in, for a long time, up until probably the Second World War, First World War for sure. Um, but at that point, it became devoted to making electricity. Uh, they were owned by Seattle Electric Company, which is down near the ferry docks. You see that big coal stack that's down there. I mean, as far as I know, it's still, I'd love to take a tour of it, but as far as I know, it's still in there as a reserve power uh, plant. But the, so the, when Coleman put the Seattle Wall and Walla to Renton, he was taking this, this Renton coal to uh, the Seattle waterfront. And then eventually that was feeding also the electric uh, generators. Um, I do want to say, I didn't point this out, but in the slide of Seattle where I was pointing to the, to the trip where they would come from Newcastle through Lake Washington across where 520 is and then go to Porsche Bay and then come down here to Pike Street, um, that uh, dock, that wharf collapsed pretty soon after the Seattle and Walla Walla and James Coleman came to, to Renton. So then they extended the track to um, Newcastle and then eventually to Black Diamond. But they didn't extend it to Black Diamond until the railroads came. Okay, next. Picture of Newcastle. So I was just talking about extended. The railroad got extended to Newcastle in the 1870s. And then Newcastle was 
a ma you know, one of the major mines around. Next. Um, <clears throat> I use this series of slides just to show a couple things. Uh, we're talking about the coal being compressed over millions of years. Well, during that millions of years, then it get the tectonic plates, start tilting it. And you have things like this right here. This is actually the entrance to the mine. And it shows you what a steep slope that that coal was, because it would be going right down the right down the crack. And you'll see this in some of these other mines too, that they also have these, these ramps that go right down into it. Um, in this picture, you can also see the water. It takes a lot of water to run uh, steam engines, which they use for lifting and dropping the coal cars up and down. Over here is a breaker where they would take the coal after it came to the top here, would go over there, they'd dump it into <clears throat> chutes and then pick through it, pick out the old bones, pick out stones, stuff like that before it would drop into a railroad car, which would be down at the bottom here. And then this is Cumberland uh, mine that would join that line that went through Franklin and Brock Diamond and then uh, eventually to Seattle. Okay, next. Another, here's, here they are descending into the coal mine. There's another picture there's another picture somewhere, I think over in the table back there, of the Black Diamond Mine and its descent down into the shafts. It's pretty hard to believe. This is a, the, the winder at the top. There's a little board here. They probably would put like flags or put color on the cable so they knew where, where to stop at each gallery. Um, but that's the job I would want right there. Okay, next. Uh, Black diamond. So here you can see that slant again. It goes these these creases. They go down at an angle. Um, you can see this wood here, which is used for propping up the mine shafts. There's a powerhouse, which is going to be powering the winches. Going to be powering cleaners. I mean, it's just generally source of power, steam. Um, it goes through the breakers here. Actually, here's the slope right here. This is this building right here. Here's the slope down into the crack and then it comes up, it goes through these breakers and then drops into the coal cars and then goes to Seattle. Next. Uh, once it got to Seattle, there was that initial wharf that we showed on Pike Street, but King Street is really where it all happened. You can see it's almost like a double, double dock and at one point it is a double dock. Um, sailing ships, again, hauling the coal down to San Francisco. There's a tug behind here. This is the captain of that tug. Um, it's going to haul that coal ship probably up to the Straits of Juan de Fuca and release it to go all over the world. Uh, there was a next door to it. There was also a lumber yard, and that's where all these, these logs are from. Okay. Uh, this is the Umatilla. It was a collier before it got converted to a passenger ship. Um, weird that we don't have many pictures of colliers. I mean, there was a lot of colliers. There was like 11 sailing colliers, and there was, uh, this was, he was, this boat was a fleet of four back when um, Newcastle and Black Diamond were bought by the Pacific, or bought by the Columbia Puget Sound Railroad and um, Villard, Henry Villard's time, uh, when they had the Oregon Improvement What's a collier? A collier is a ship that hauls coal. <laughs> um, but you know, this has a superstructure now, but it shows you kind of the general size of, that they were and how much of a, a business they were doing. Okay, next. This is the tug, tug Wanderer. It was made over in Port Blakely across from Seattle. It would have been one of the tugs that was hauling these sailing ships. Uh, out the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and of course they were full of, after the railroads got here, they were also full of taking grain uh, in sailing ships, and lumber in sailing ships, um, but also coal. And it's a beautiful boat, and um, it has a steam engine actually built in outside of Portland, but we don't hold it against them. Uh, there was a boiler, they, asked, they had a boiler that was made in Seattle, um, and coal, a lot of the, these early, not only trains, but also steamboats, they would use slab wood, but coal is much, burns much hotter. It's actually much cleaner. Um, you know, it's just, 
it's a much we like the difference between coal and oil is kind of like the difference between wood and wood and coal. And we think of coal as dirty, but I think that wood and and ashes would have been a lot dirtier. <clears throat> okay, next. This is just to show you three different ships here. Uh, the SS Pacific here, side wheeler going to San Francisco. Uh, it was a passenger ship when the first scheduled passenger ships going from Seattle to San Francisco, and it's on Yesler's dock. And um, it had a horrible crash. 150 people died outside the Umatilla Reef, on the Umatilla Reef in the Pacific. And only one person survived. It was kind of an old boat even when it started. The SS Salvador over here, it seems like a weird name for a, for a ship serving Seattle, but before uh, there was the, the Panama Canal, there would be a railroad that would go from the east side of Panama over to the west side of Panama and uh, would then meet the SS Salvador and, and ships like that and uh, they would come up to San Francisco. So once they made that connection, they didn't need these ships anymore. So they started going on the Seattle route. This is just a schooner. Um, schooners were everywhere. I mean, they were, the, they were the tramp steamers of the time. Next, Georgie Star. This, now this is still, when the George Star was built in Seattle, and I don't know about the machinery, but there was a lot of machinery that was being built at this time before the railroads in Seattle. Um, but the boat was definitely built in Seattle. Um, and it would be used for the going up to Victoria and the kind of the inter, intercoastal run. Not necessarily, this kind of boat would not go to San Francisco, but it would be more of the regional transportation. And there again, coal is just much more efficient and it was these, this boat, as well as the Mosquito Fleet, is based out of Seattle, I believe, because that's where the coal was. You know, you, if that's what you use, then you want to be there. Um, it, but it also indicates the, the technology of the skills to be making steam engines and to be making boilers, um, to be founding uh, iron and, I don't know about steel, but certainly founding iron and brass was present at a very early age and uh, ironworking. And again, Yesler's workshop was the first place to use coal and to use it for metal, but very soon there, after you had foundries and you had boiler makers and such what. Okay. This is just a picture of, I love this picture, it's over here too. It just shows you the domestic market. I mean, there was, not only was it exporting to, to San Francisco, it also was exported pretty much around the Pacific, including to Australia, but there was also quite a large domestic market. And this is, uh, I assume these are all part of the Seattle Coal and Fuel Company, I and mean, it could be something else, a Teamster convention or something. But these are all coal, coal cars here. All along, the, you can see the back here is probably a, sh a ship, or at least a dare, it's probably down, located down near the, down near the waterfront. Okay, next. Institutions, huge users of coal. University of Washington, the coal stack is still up. They don't use the coal anymore, but they were one of the last people to use coal. This stack right here, it's still there. This powerhouse is still there on Cherry Hill, next to Swedish Cherry Hill. Um, it's a be beautiful piece of engineering. Unbelievable, definitely recommend if you're up uh, on top of Cherry Hill that you check it out. Next. Uh, breweries. This is a picture of Rainier Brewery. I mean, a coal stacks, powerhouse over here. They use the hot water for boiling the, the malt. They use it for cleaning. They use it for canning. Um, use it for pumping stuff around a uh, lot. And this is the railroad right here, which went right to Renton and Newcastle so they could get their get their coal right there, as well as the hops that were being grown in Auburn were close by, and then when it connected to the trains, they were bringing in the wheat from uh, Eastern Washington. Okay, next. 
cans, you know, coal was used to create steam and heat. Those other places also used for canning of uh, salmon. This is actually from up in Bellingham, but it's the same kind of technology. And these are called retorts, and they would just roll the cans in there and, you know, pressure cook them and roll them back out and sell them. Okay, next. Centennial Mill Company. This is a power you can always recognize coal sacks. I find them all the time in Seattle. It's actually bizarre. There's one down near the Fred Myers. I found one on top of the um, Paramount. You know, as soon as you see a stack like that, that's not a diesel stack. That's a coal stack. Um, and this was when we were connected to the trains. Once you had a train trail across, the, across from eastern Washington, there was be a powerhouse. There'd be millstones in there. They'd be milling flour. And this is pretty close to Moran's shipyard, but and these are still, you look, a horse and buggy, you know, these are still the horse and buggy times. These are horse and buggy and trains. There's, there's no cars. Okay. <clears throat> um, industry. Uh, Sue, so this is Taylor up in the watershed um, uh, near Ravensdale, uh, Cedar River watershed. It's been, it's just now an archaeological site. Uh, these are, you can see the tracks up here going, but it had coal and clay in layers. So it could actually extract the coal and extract the clay like in the same mines. Um, and they produce sewer pipe of which I believe Seattle's early sewer pipe was coming from this factory. But the kilns, you know, here's probably, these are probably kilns being you fired by coal to, uh, for the sewer pipe. These are probably a powerhouse down here for running things like machinery to mix the coal, to, to send it through sieves, to take the debris out of it. Um, there's big industry right up there in the middle of, middle of the watershed. Okay, next. Uh, this is the plant, steel plant in West Seattle. Uh, look, at those are all coal stacks along there. Uh, to to use foundry, to use foundry work to actually reduce metal out of ore, you use coke, which is a converted kind of coal. It's basically a heated up coal, it's more pure. But this is just for regular foundry work. Um, I always like to observe that, you know, there's no safety. He doesn't even have gloves on, you know, pulling out these, you know, roasting out. And I do, I know you all like this stuff. If you ever get a chance to go into this, into West Seattle and go to that, uh, found, go to that plant, it will awe you. It's just like, it was almost a religious experience. It's like amazing uh, tour to take. Okay. Uh, 1891, the train's here, just showing you a, a street of a boiler works. Um, just a real quick note on photography a lot of the photography that was being done in the early days, it would be mounted on a big, you know, huge scale kind of thing. Um, so there were people like uh, Curtis, Asha Curtis, who's Edward Curtis's brother, I believe, or cousin, but they're related, who photographed all the Indians, all the Native Americans. His brother, Asha, uh, photographed a lot of in industri industry sites. And some of these pictures that I've shown you have been from him. But this is not. But this just shows you the, the scale of you know, the work that was being done there. And that's a pretty dang big boiler there. Uh, and this is down on Commercial Street, which becomes First Avenue after the fire. OK, next. Vulcan Ironworks was originally Seattle Ironworks. And in, they produced steam engines, they produced boilers, they produced sawmill equipment, they produced um, hop furnaces. Um, they were pretty major, um, pretty major in that way. And I wouldn't doubt this over here is King Street, the, the coal wharf over here. Uh, that might, that's, I don't know what that is. Look at a little peak cathedral, I mean, or I don't know, maybe UW back in the day. Uh, it's always interesting to see these things blown up as opposed to seeing them small. You see, see different things in it. But Vulcan Ironworks, um, you know, yeah, doing the stuff. 
Okay, next. Not only did we do a lot of uh, building of boilers and machinery and stuff, but there's also a huge shipbuilding industry. Halls Brothers, which was over in Port Blakely, next to uh, the Port Blakely Mill, uh, produced a lot of uh, wooden chips, like 102, I want to say, from like 18... 90s to 1903, don't quote me on that, but they, they had a very major shipyard operation there. And, and that takes, of course, nor skills um, and takes industrial know-how and takes capital and all those things that you associate with industry. Next. So probably the biggest thing in our industrial history is the Nebraska. And this was built by Moran Brothers down near the King Street coal docks. Um, it was a, a Virginia class battleship, which is not a huge one. Um, it was built in 1904, um, and so it didn't participate in the Spanish-American War, but it, and it never saw any kind of combat duty, but it did go on some world tours. Um, anyhow, it's a pretty amazing ship. Next. Is that a steel hull ship? You know, whether it's steel or not, I'm not sure, but the, um, the metal came actually from Irondale, which was, is up near Port Hadlock, yes. near Port Townsend. And I, I'm not sure if it's steel or iron. Iron's a very capable shipbuilding material as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it was actually that a lot of the metal work came from Irondale. Next. I love these guys. Uh, <clears throat> so that's Frank there. He was uh, the foundry guy. He would do all the foundry work in the shop in the Moran Brothers. Uh, this is Sherman. <clears throat> he kind of ran. He was his Robert's right hand man. He's the guy that actually you know carried out the orders. He look he looks like a could be a really tough character if he wanted to be. I think. And then Robert, who is here. Um, amazing guy, uh, you know, really did work himself up from nothing to, uh, an, to an amazing artistic soul. He also, I just learned this yesterday, he was the engineer on John Muir's um, trip to Alaska. And so they got to know each other and became friends. And uh, that's one of the reasons why he saved Moran State Park and turned and Rosera turned it into a state park because of the influence of Muir. Next, um, just to look at the Nebraska a little closer. Uh, this is pretty complicated little drill here, and one of the reasons is because you're drilling boilerplate. And as you might know, boilers are round, so they have to when you drill the holes that you. Have, you have to be very exact and you have to have the right angle and everything else. Um, these are the, the high-tech workers of their time. Uh, next. This is the engine from the Nebraska. Um, notice, see this guy over here? When the old days, they would set up a camera and just let it sit because they couldn't, didn't get a flight. And, but people would go around, like look around the corner, like what's that, you know, what's, what's going on? But you'll see in the next picture, notice these trusses up here, that this is like 25 feet high. I mean, this is huge. You look at how tall he is, and you kind of put the perspective out. He's, you know, that's, it's, these are huge engines. Next. Um, we also were producing pre-World War I submarines, um, the, which is a very fascinating thing. Um, again, high tech stuff at the time. Uh, next. And then, you know, ultimately, people don't think about this very often, but the red, we've all been to the red barn, I bet, right? Well, that was originally a boat shop. And it was the Taconite, which is Bill Boeing's yacht, was built there at the red barn. And he used the people then, he bought that factory and started to make airplanes. Uh, it's the same technology. This is all wood. And you have rudders. You have you know, a light structure, strong structure. Um, it was 
after building ships and then dealing with some of these other technologies, we were able to have the workforce to, to make this very high-tech item. Next. And then lastly, you know, Pacific Car and Foundry, again, here in Renton, you're all familiar with it, I'm sure. Um, I was amazed to find that they were producing tanks during the Second World War, Sherman tanks. Um, it not only, I always thought, we think of B-17, or I think of B-17s and the Flying Fortress and stuff like that being made here, but they were also assembling Sherman tanks. Okay. That is it. There you go. I'll be in the back if you have any questions and uh, love to share your book. Sure, I'd love to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, early on you mentioned the uh, Issaquah coal mine. Can you yep. locate that for us? Sure. Um, there's actually even a little... Um, uh, why don't we go back to the coal mines, the very first one, too, just so we have it. There, if you know where the salmon breeding area is, there's a stream that comes down into that. There, and there's a bridge that goes across that stream, and then there's a, some information boards right there with some pictures, um, and talks about the old Gilman, Gilman mine. Mm. Anything else? Yeah. How deep the coal mine were? How deep in the ground? Some of them were very deep. I mean, the the one for Black Diamond was at one point the deepest coal mine. Um, I believe, and if not North America, the world, maybe somebody else knows how deep it is, but it's like 3,200 feet deep, something like that. And maybe that's deep, so it's like like a mile. Uh, a few levels of shafts. Yeah, if you just look at how long the shaft was versus how deep it was, it's, it's like a mile. I mean, it's, it, it was incredibly long. And the shifts were like 10 hours per shift? Um, I don't know that i mean there was a lot of um there was certainly a lot of uh, organization of, of labor in the mines very early on the knights of labor uh organized uh protests and there was actually somebody died uh in franklin during a riot and strike breakers were brought in i mentioned it a little bit in my my book but then the united mine workers didn't organize in the 1920s so they were pretty organized from pretty early on so i'm not sure whether it was 10 hours or how they how they figured that but it was there yeah you showed a picture of uh cumberland and these water troughs yeah are those the ones that are still there around the uh, kamchatka cumberland road they go right along there and they're like these little troughs with little cross Hmm. I would doubt it. There's the springs, like near Franklin. There's some some spring water, and I've gotten spring water from there. But I don't. To tell you the truth, I'm not really. I I don't really know where the Cumberland mine was in Cumberland. I always assumed it was kind of behind where there's that biker bar. Yeah. There's there's like a big slag heat. It seems like a slag heap oh, up you there. To the east of that. To the east of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I don't really know. I mean, it, we. There was, and there was a lot of vines. I mean, there was like, Cumberland, in that area especially, there was like eight, ten major mines and then many, many, many small mines that were run by somebody and that would be selling probably coal to the Yesler or something well, like that. There's several rows of, looks just like that, these, these water troughs with the, Cross. you know, the cross things down underneath them. Well, I'll definitely look for them next time I'm out there. It's a nice little excursion getting up there. Out the Cumberland Road to the south, they're on the, on the right. Okay, the cool. Anybody else? What was the spark that made you want to start researching all of this? Uh, doing that underwater survey in Lake Union. All of a sudden, I, when I, I realized that they were bringing coal from Newcastle to Lake Union before the locks were in, were in, and then in, I started getting intrigued. Like, what this is? This is this is pretty major thing. And at that point, they were doing like three thousand to five thousand tons a month by taking it this convoluted route. But because there were no other mines really um, on the West Coast, Seattle was the the mine. There were mines up in Nanaimo, of course. You know, you guys have been to Nanaimo. 
major coal port. Ladysmith was a major coal port uh, as well, but it was not American. Um, and there was probably they'd get into little tiffles about, you know, taxes and stuff like that. And I'm sure that would go on. And I could be wrong here, but I love to speculate. Um, but I was wondering why when I was in Port Townsend, you had this fort that was being built in like the 1870s. Um, you know, why? Why would you need a, need a fort to protect Puget Sound? There wasn't anything here. And then I realized, oh, coal. They were trying to protect the coal because if you could control the coal on the, east, on the west coast, that, that would be pretty major strategical thing. <laughs> So they were transferring the, the coal from land to Lake Washington over land. Were they in containers or was it? Was it cars. Uh, so they were cars, uh, sort of coal cars. Yeah. They and actually somebody there. here from Newcastle could probably tell you how big they are, but I think they were like three tons or how big were the coal cars? One to two tons. One to two tons. Typically 16 cars that fit on a barge. And they would barge them across Lake Washington and then portage them into Lake Union and then put them on a barge again to the south end of Lake Union. And then use a little locomotive to pull them up West Lake Avenue to Pike and then from Pike down to the waterfront. And that was the first locomotive uh, in Seattle. And it's like a little narrow gauge um, thing. Yeah, eventually, yeah, called the ant. Um, the other, uh, yeah, that just, that's pretty. Just, I don't know, that, that, that amazes me. So anyhow, there's all these, turns out there's, oh, there's all these ships on the bottom of Lake Union, not because of crashes or anything, but because when they were worn out, they would just kind of push them off and shuttle them. So you have the, the J.E. Boyden, which was a steamship, which was built in 1880. And of course, that's way before the, the locks were in place. But at a certain point, it just got worn out and they took it out and sank it. You know, so here's this, May, you know, this old steam tug that because it's in fresh water is very well preserved. It doesn't have its cabin top, but it's it's there on your charts. If you look, there's a wreck right off the center for wooden boats, and that's the J.E. Boyden. But there was tons, I mean, lots and lots of other ships that sunk into the muck all around. The only reason that didn't, because it was so big, it kind of floats on top of the silt there. Any other questions? Yeah, they do. Yeah, through the I took one with the uh, Seattle Historical Society. Um, I don't know if Newcastle Historical Society has ever done one there, but they are open to doing that. And it, what's that? Are they open for public? They might have some public days, like every year, and have a couple of public days. I just go on their website and uh, and see. Yeah, hi. They only like then they only make now rebar as their major product. And they call commercial sections like C sections, I beams, angles. You know, it's very simple stuff, but it's very necessary for building. And coal, you mentioned about the coal was delivered down to San Francisco. Was it also shipped to Alaska? It was, yeah. And it was a big impetus when the United States took over uh, Alaska in the 1868, I believe, somewhere right around there. Um, but there also is on um, in the ABC Islands, which is right near Sitka. There is a coal mine there, but it was much cheaper to get the coal um, from Seattle. It was a, it was a hard hard coal to hoe, if you will, up there. Okay, well there you, there you have it. <laughs>